briefly, I want to talk about uh, an article in the Sunday Mirror today, which was put together by uh, an investigative reporter who is author of Democracy for Sale, Dark Money and Dirty Politics. He's behind this exclusive report in the newspaper. He is uh, Peter Gagan, and this is all about Rishi Sunak's wife and her family, who founded and still have a healthy percentage in the IT firm based in India called Infosys. Hi, Peter. Hi, Carol. How are you? Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, oh, well, tell me, tell me the basis of this report. Well, essentially, this this firm Infosys, which, as you say, it, it was founded by Rishi Sunak's father-in-law, who's an Indian IT billionaire who set up this this company. It's a global company. Infosys has got about three hundred thousand employees around the world, and a, one of the, a, one of the major shareholders or someone who holds quite a big stake in it is Rishi Sunak's wife, who owns about three million shares in Infosys. Which so, and that's worth a, over six hundred million pounds. Over six hundred million pounds, yeah. yes. And, and Infosys basically over the last few years, they they've ha- been winning more and more government contracts. Um, they're, and as I say, they're a big global firm. But uh, what I was reporting is that they've now been put on a couple of major framework agreements. And what these framework agreements essentially mean is they're an opportunity for suppliers to do more work for the public sector, to get more public sector contracts. And they've been put on two pretty major ones worth about 750 million wow. uh, in in total. So no awards have yet been made under these, but they do make it much more likely that you're going to win contracts. And I also kind of looked at how many public contracts Infosys has won. It's won about 66 million in total in the UK, with about 47 million coming since 2020 when Rishi Sunak became the Chancellor. And the Cabinet Office will say, right, you know, reasonably that ministers aren't involved in making decisions Mm. around individual procurement, etc. But I think it's really in the public interest to at least be aware of when a company that has a political connection like this are on big procurement contracts. Particularly because, you know, when he was Chancellor uh, from 2015, when he became a member of Parliament and and then he became Chancellor, and I think it was in 2021 or two, when it was discovered by a newspaper that she had claimed non-DOM status on her dividend payments uh, due to the shares that she owned in this massive company. Uh, all perfectly legal. Uh, to claim non-DOM status, you actually have to sign a form and say, I'm going to pay you a flat fee, I think at the time of £30,000, instead of the uh, a- approximate amount of tax, if it was me, for instance, uh, who would pay £4 million pounds or 4 or £5 million pounds on that um, income because it, it was estimated that the income on her shares in dividend income um, was around 11 million pounds a year um, and then he defended her, oh what my wife does has got nothing to do with me la 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 anyway in the end there was such a kerfuffle that she decided to stop that but she still didn't pay the 20 million pound back tax not that Anything she did was illegal, I hasten to add. But they set the rules, don't they? Um, so it is of public interest. What what gets me really, Peter, is that he does not have to declare any of this on his register of interests. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think that's one of the more interesting things about this, you know, because as you say, like um, as, as um, Richie Sank's wife, has received really significant dividend yeah. payments. Like Infosys says pays a lot. It pays about three percent in dividends. And if you have six hundred odd million pounds worth of shares at three percent, that's a lot of money. Yeah. You know, it's about thirteen million pounds last year. And under the rules, there was actually the um, the parliamentary standards had a look at this and decided that Rishi Sunak didn't have to declare his wife's interest in in Infosys. And I think especially against the backdrop of Rishi Sunak was very resistant to talk about his own taxes. He eventually brought them out <laughs> because he has so much of an income from uh, from shares and dividends. He only pays an effective rate of about 22 percent which unlike me and probably you too where we you know yeah. you pay the, the tax rate the tax rate of a paye worker is a lot higher than that yes it is and national insurance he would pay capital gains tax if it was on a certain kind of income yeah and it's a much lower rate and i think that's that's the aspect of this and the fact that you don't have to declare some of these things and it's also you know there's a wider thing with this when it comes to shareholding so mps in general don't have to declare they don't have to declare shareholdings over 70 over 70,000 pounds which is quite a lot of money if you think about it in yes. terms of the shareholding a lot of people don't have shareholdings like that and small enough movements in shares can make a lot of money for people like in the case of you know, in the case of uh, um, a 600 million pound shareholding in infosys it doesn't take a lot to increase the amount 
amount of money that's going to come into you for the dividend on the back of that. And I, I would imagine that in terms of the value of a company, the more government contracts they have, the higher the value. So it's not just about the profit, is it? It's about the share value increasing. Yeah, and a lot of these companies, it's really interesting to think about, you know, moving out from just emphasis at a wider issue around this. Like, if you look, take a company like Fujitsu, it's been a news out around the post office yes. scandal. A lot of these companies are essentially just procurement companies. They are large procurement companies yeah. who work more with government than they work with anybody else. As we saw with the procurement with with post office with the post office, often the margins on government contracts are much higher, even if they're perfectly legitimate. They're very high margins, and the the oversight can be actually often quite low, as we saw again with the post office scandal. And this is this is how a lot of companies like this operate. It is about moving into markets and becoming a, a preferred procurement provider and becoming someone who gets regular into procurement space and then it becomes a slightly self-fulfilling prophecy and share value will increase because you more the bottom line will increase and will increase pretty much steadily because once you're inside these circles of procurement you know once you're on these sort of framework agreements it's much easier what's called a call off so basically once you're on the framework agreement and you can just be kind of directly awarded contracts without most, without having competition for that contract because you've already been pre-approved yeah. essentially it allows, and so you can see the the government's the case for this is a public sector case. You can make contracts much quicker. But if you look at a lot of Infosys previous contracts, they were just they were they were kind of open competition yeah. contracts. Once you're moving into these spheres where you're able to be on framework contracts, like lots of other suppliers are, there's about sixty odd suppliers on one of these on one of these framework contracts, which is total about over five hundred million pounds uh, cost on it. But it means you're in a space where you're going to get more government work. It becomes pretty self fulfilling. Yeah. Peter, thank you so much for this. I'm just going to say one last thing: is that uh, you know what I'm like. I'm, I'm forever like. <laughs> <laughs> investigating myself. And 20 years ago, Fujitsu and Infosys set up a, a global partnership, did they not? Um, so uh, I, I just find that connection interesting. I'm not saying that anybody has done anything wrong. I just find it an interesting point. Peter Gagan, thank you so much for that. Carry on doing what you're doing. Peter is the author of Democracy for Sale, Dark Money and Dirty Politics.